What's up, fight fans? Welcome to the UFC Fight Night 140 post-fight show brought to you by SBN MMA, which includes websites like BloodyElbow.com and MMAMania.com. I'm joined once again by the guys from the sixth round post-fight show, the Eddie Mercado and the Zane Simon. Zane, a couple of weeks ago when we watched UFC Moncton, you said it was hashtag UFC uh, contractual obligations. Was that the same Mm -hmm. thing that we had tonight? Yeah, I mean, th- this wasn't even actually UFC contractual obligations. This was UFC, like, this was UFC over expansion. Like, contractual obligations is kind of like the, oh, we've got a bunch of good, or, of decent fighters that we've signed for contracts that we need to give fights to, and we just had to find a card to fill it. This was more, I mean, this card was half dudes that they just signed for a card like this. Like, what the fuck is Umberto Bandene and Loriano Staropoli and Hector Aldana and Jesus Pinedo and Devin Powell and Anderson Dos Santos doing in the UFC except to be filler on this fucking card? That's pretty much you know? it. Yeah, we were just talking about how you used to have to watch the LFA and stuff to see who would be the next person to be in the UFC. Now you just watch the UFC to see who would be the next person to be actually on a decent card that people will pay attention to. <laughs> The UFC is the is the new LFA. They become their own hardcore regional product. Yeah, so I came off of this fight card uh, not really excited to do this post-fight show, even though I love talking to you guys. The fight card wasn't that great. It didn't end with any ebbs or any flows. I couldn't tell you what the fight of the night was, but Eddie Mercado is always Mr. Positivity. Shine some light <laughs> on this thing. Give us some brightness. Man. All right. There are a couple takeaways. Lamas getting a TKO on Elkins is kind of a big deal. Elkins is super hard to finish, and Lamas desperately needed a win. Uh, Pons Nibio, uh, man, that fight should have – the corner should have threw in the towel. Yeah, but, I mean, you might as well ask for divine – you might as well act, ask for an act of God. Like, saying the corner should have thrown in the towel, the ref just could have stepped in when Magni went down that last time and, like, could barely get back up. Like, the – Dean when he was hobbling away. Yeah, or Dean can just at that point just wave it off and say, okay, you're done. I was well, thinking that Magna should, should have just uh, tapped a strikes. I know that they're these guys have too much pride or whatever to do that nowadays, but he wasn't going to win. He was on one one wheel. From, yeah. like, Jump Street, though. Like, he, lo- he was in survival mode for, like, 97% of that fight, yeah. and that fight went into the fourth round. Like, yeah. it was just, man, that fight should have been stopped by somebody. <laughs> like someone who like cares about sport and, yeah. and the sport I mean, side of things. You, you gotta always look to the ref first on that. Corners, a lot of corners don't even think you can stop the fight because the commission will tell them you're not allowed to throw in the towel. That's a rule infraction, not a way to stop the fight. But it'll still stop those. It'll stop whatever the fuck's going on. You hit the referee with the towel. I've seen refs take the towel and throw it out of the cage. I've seen that once. Yeah. Ooh. I've seen that one time in boxing. I've, no, I've seen it in MMA. I've seen it in MMA, too. But still, I think it, the fight should have been stopped. It, it, I don't. I didn't like seeing that unnecessary beating. And, like, it ended with Magni face planting, where, like, any normal day I'd have been stoked on it. But because it came on the tail end of just a complete one-sided assault, it, it just it wasn't satisfying for me. He was already done before he got knocked out. He didn't need to get knocked out. Yeah. Right, and we talk about all the time how these fight cards, our lasting impression is how the main event turned out. And the main event, one-sided beatdown, no ebbs, no flows. So the whole card for me came off as, I'd, I'd give it a rating of a, I'm just going to go A to F. I'd go a D. I normally go 1 to 10 or whatever. Yeah, D, failing grade. Eddie, and, don't, go ahead, Zane. I was going to say, it's weird, though, because... It should be noted that the last one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven of the last eight fights on this fight card ended in finishes. Like, that should be fun. Yeah, but you most know? of those finishes were just, like, obliterations. There was there was no moments to ha- get, like, tensed up about it. When Pantoja uh, finished Sasaki, it was just, like, cut through him like a hot knife through butter. Uh, Prezeris first Fabinski's same thing just fucking bam there was no time to get invested in the ebb or a flow or the, the trajectory of the fight changing yeah 
it's just weird. It is weird to think that, like, I'm not disagreeing with you. It's just, it it does show that, like, there's a real, there's something really wrong with the product you're putting together at that point when you can't, like, there's even action going on and it still just doesn't feel important at all. Well, it's also like four o'clock or I think it's four o'clock yeah. in the morning in Buenos Aires. And, yeah. uh... None of the fights meant anything, and then the FS1 pacing just... Yeah. And, I mean, it started with four decisions. Oh, yeah, no, it started with a a momentum-killing slog, but that ended pretty quickly. Like, it... The rest of the fight card was all finishes. It's just... It didn't matter. (laughs) It is weird. It just... I, I don't think I've ever... I'm not sure if I can remember ever feeling this way, where there's been so many finishes to close out an event, but it, they all still kind of feel like decisions in some way. I don't yeah. know. I still have that like, oh, this was a decision fest. And it's like, no, it wasn't. Well, no, even Llamas versus that. Elkins was, you know, got Llamas started winning and then he just won until the inevitable finish. And it might, it could have gone to the judges. What's crazy is the the main event and the co-main event, I mean, the real moral of those stories were leg kicks mm-hmm. and, and those were the turning points in those fights. Ponzinibbio just happened a lot earlier. And uh, Elkins, you know, he did really well in that first round. But come round two, once he really started taking those leg kicks and hobbling, it was completely one-sided. Yeah, and I, the, the, the commentary, I don't even know if it was a commentary. I think it's just like Elkins' busyness got him, a, people feeling like he was doing a lot better than he was too, where he's like, you know, stepping in and throwing these wild shots and none of them are landing, but yeah. he's stepping in and he's throwing a lot of shots. So people were like, oh, Elkins, he went, he won the first round. You see his face is bloody and Lamas is just fine. It's like, he got one big takedown. Then otherwise, mostly just eight jabs and a few hard shots. Yeah. And had some clinching moments, yeah, some positional had- wins yeah. there, but... but and it's never good when the commentators are mentioning how his nickname is The Damage and he's bleeding like 35 seconds into the fight. It's great that you can sustain a lot of damage, but it's really not good for your health or your ability to truly win well, fights. I mean, nobody at this point in Elkin's career thinks that he's going to ride off into the sunset and like... Have fluid speech? Yeah. Right. Like, how many gallons of blood has Darren Elkin spilled? In the octagon? In- in the octagon alone. More than I've ever I spilled. A whole hospital full of children off that. <laughs> yeah. A, a, a complete transfusion. That's right. At least one other human entirely full of blood. <laughs> oh, man. But well, what, I, need what, to... I don't. Why does this card suck so bad, guys? You know what it is? It might be because it's almost like a movie where, like, the hero does everything right and he doesn't change and there's no adversity. And it's just like it's just boring. There's no excitement. It's like yeah, we got finishes, but maybe maybe if you came in only for the main card, you would have a different opinion or you would feel differently. But because we sat through the whole thing, maybe we're a little jaded. Could be. I'm certainly jaded. It felt like the longest card I've ever watched, and it definitely yeah. wasn't. No, it's only twelve fights. We've had like fourteen fight cards that have all gone to decisions. You know. It just felt so long. This got in exa- almost exactly on time, which is actually pretty rare for an FS1 card. I don't know. It's an enigma. Is there Are the planets lining in some weird way that we don't know about? I think it's just what happens when you have Johnny Walker versus Khalil Roundtree. It's like the middle fight on a main card. And like Marlon Vera versus Guido Canetti and Ian Heinish versus Cesar Fajardo. Like These just aren't fights that anybody... Like, it's just a whole card of prelims. Yeah. Like a whole event. card of Dana White's Tuesday Night Contender Series capped off by Ricardo Lamas and Santiago Ponzinibbio. And even the main event, honestly, would have feels like it would have been a co-main for a fight night fight card, like, three years ago. Yeah, or the prelim main event, or, like, the final prelim on a pay-per-view. The featured, the featured prelim. Yeah. Yeah, it feels like a feature prelim bout. Let's think about well, something positive to talk about on the fight card before I let you guys go. Let's uh, let's get some positivity in here. Just Zane, one okay, thing on the fight. I got okay, you. Yeah, I got you. Good, I got Eddie. you. So, this will be my my what the fuck moment also. Okay. So Michel Prezeris coming out getting a club and sub like that, like actually being exciting for a change. Yeah. Okay. 
I'm with that. Two and zero now at 170 pounds on an eight fight winning streak. You know, I that maybe he's turning a new leaf. Maybe he's gonna, you know, actually become exciting enough to to get noticed for a title run. By 43, he'll be in contention. Yeah, that's it. He turned but that leaf over to the positive side, but he wants to go back tripping. to the negative side. <laughs> we have to flop back. It's inherent. The card. The card is like possessed. Maybe that's yeah. what it is. I was saying, Prezeris, he was like, uh, he won this fight. He's doing really well at welterweight, but he said he wants to go back to lightweight. Yeah. What the hell, man? Well, I mean, it's not like he wasn't winning there, too. Well, yeah. but yeah, but we weighing it at 161. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> well. Yeah. I don't know, man. Fuck this card. Yeah. <laughs> And that's so unfortunate. It's just so irrelevant. It doesn't matter. Like, the main event kind of does, but it just doesn't matter. Like, it yeah. really doesn't matter. Well, like, like, we had, we had like, top flyweights, and it's like, oh, cool. You going to call out Joseph Benavides? Like, cool. Like, the division's up in the air. Like, what are you doing? Dead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I can't even care about flyweight fights anymore. It's especially too bad for Pantoja, who is actually, like, He's five foot five. He's a true flyweight size. Like if it, yeah. now if it was Ulka Sasaki having a fantastic performance, he's five foot ten. He's been at one thirty five a few times. Pantoja's actually tiny. Like where is he really gonna go fight up a division? No, he's gonna go to a different league. Yep. Yep. He's gonna go fight uh, Horiguchi. That'd be fun. Yeah. yeah. Zane, you got For something sure. positive to talk about? <laughs> I'll say that Johnny Walker's knockout of Khalil Roundtree was pretty fucking cool. Yeah, and, yeah. and we got a future contender there. I mean, it, it in as much as beating Khalil Roundtree makes you a future contender, sure. Like, yeah, it's like well, anyway. it, 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 the way it happened and the yeah. display of athleticism automatically makes me want to see him fight Yoel Romero and or Paulo Costa. So yeah. that by default makes him in contention <laughs> yeah no it's definitely like it's a cool it's a cool finish he's huge for the division and looks you know he's did, got did you see that backflip he did so. he's what? fucking backflipping like i know jesus christ and he like flows through the air it's not like one of those like ugly big man like sean jordan does a backflip this is like dude you could be a gymnast but like like man he yeah. is a freak i just hope he can stay clean and and he doesn't pop on any <laughs> You saw the tests, and because damn it, the the more new blood in that division, the better. That's why I liked your comparison yeah. to him and Paulo Costa. Same appearance, kind of. Yeah, I mean, he's he's in a division where you're kind of supposed to look like that. You're supposed to be tall and lean and super athletic. Paulo Costa, he's Uberlandia Reem. I mean, the dude got a fucking bicep tear. How many fighters you know go out and like that's a bodybuilder injury? <laughs> mm -hmm. The bicep tear. But both Romero and Costa are middleweights. I wanted to see Johnny Walker versus like Dominic Reyes. I know that's a contender killer, but I don't care. It would be a cool ass fight to see at some point. Definitely. I mean, Walker just needs to win a couple more fights. You win three or four fights in that division, and you're immediately in title contention. So. Right. That's true. All right, so we're doing our best to try to make this card positive, and it's just not happening. Yeah. <laughs> it's just not fucking happening. I don't I'm too tired for this. Yeah, so it our collective the what the fit. fuck of the card is basically the card. Just Yeah, how how we're so turned off despite the ample finishes. Yeah. Marlon Vera had a really awesome comeback win over Guido Canetti. Mm -hmm. Cynthia Calvillo ran through Pollyanna Batello. Yeah. Like, some good shit in there, but... Doesn't uh, mean too much, you know? Yeah. It means nothing. Oh, I wanted to ask you guys, so UFC Moncton did 531,000 views on Fox Sports 1. What do you think this does? Oh, like 300,000? <laughs> yeah. What's, like, the base level? I'm going to say three views. Us three. <laughs> That's all that fucking watched this card was the three of us. Yeah. 
No, I, I think Mookie was saying he was watching traffic during the event for Bloody Elbow and basically said that our traffic was like there wasn't even a UFC event at all. <laughs> like, we got nothing out of this. So. Yeah, well, they, I mean, just look at it. It looks like a Combate Americas card. Which was going on at the same time. Yeah. Could have got them both in. That's where everybody's at. Just a double dose. Yeah. Combate. They're taking over. Yep. Well, well, Zane, you want to do the sign-off, tell the people where to find uh, the sixth round? Where yeah, you can do that show right now, right? You're super pumped. Counter the whole thing. You can find me at the Zane Time, and you can find Eddie at the Eddie Mercado. You can find on Twitter, both of us over on Twitter. You can find us at bloodyelbow.com, day in, day out. We will be dropping the sixth round post-fight show tomorrow on Sunday, and uh, we'll be back. I don't think we're doing a sixth round for UFC Beijing. I know I'm not watching it live, so... I'll be watching it live, so I might be doing one with Mookie, maybe. Oh, okay. Something like that. If, if you're Mookie's watching up, live, I don't know. Take over. I'm going to be a fucking sleep. There's no way. Uh, it's well, three, it starts at 3 in the morning for me. Oof. Yeah, that's rough. 6 a.m. Yeah. for me, so I can do that. Or 6.30. Yeah, 6.30, 7.30, I would do it, but not 3.30. No, it's not happening. Especially the day and, after Black uh, Friday sales? Oh, yeah. I'm sure you're a Black Friday shopper, right? That's right. We'll have uh, the Viva section coming back at you next week for that card, though. And uh, follow us on Bloody Elbow Presents over on SoundCloud, iTunes, YouTube, all that good shit. And uh, we'll see you there. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for being here, Zane. Thanks for being here, Eddie. Adios. See you guys. All right, live viewers. Flying Brian J here. Solo going to recap this card. If you're still here, you guys are now going to be my co-host instead of the guys from the sixth round post-fight show. And if you're here live, please give the video a thumbs up. I need them. I need the bosses to make to, to believe that you guys like hanging out with me and you like the new format of the show. I'm going to try to be as positive as I can as we recap the rest of this card. So in the main event of the evening, if you don't want spoilers, you probably shouldn't be on the video at all. But Santiago Genchiboa Ponzinibbio finished... Neil Gumby Magny via knockout in the fourth round, 236, in a fight where we already talked about no ebbs, no flows. Jen Chiboa came out right away, and it wasn't an eye poke, but he hurt the right eye of Magny with, a, I think it was probably a lead left hook. Um, and he did that a few times. Magny was really pawing at that. Magny was eating a lot of low kicks. But from the very start when he got his eye hurt, he was on the back foot, uh, not really putting much fight back on Ponzinibbio. Uh, and it was all just downhill from, for Magny from like the first 45 seconds. What's next for Jen Chiboa? I was thinking that he needs um, to move toward a title shot. In his post-fight interview, he was talking about how he thinks that he's going to get the belt. And he even like, said some things to uh, Tyron Woodley, who Tyron Woodley was in the booth tonight. And he said that he's coming for the belt. He's going to be the first person to uh, win a title for Argentina. I think that Jen Chiboa should fight probably Wonder Boy. I was thinking either Wonder Boy or the loser of Rafael Dos Anjos versus Marty Usman, Kamaru Usman, which that fight, RDA versus Usman, happens uh, next week. No, it happens on the 30th, doesn't it? It's very soon. Well, yep, on November 30th. It's a weird date. But anyway, so I was thinking Ponzinibbio could try to move himself toward a title shot by doing something like that. What post-fight rating would you guys give the card from 1 to 5? With 5 being a really great card, 1 being you didn't watch the thing, or you, you wish you wouldn't have watched the thing. As I said, I would give it a D, uh, A to F, and for my post-fight rating of 1 to 5, I'd give it a 2. You know, it's just, it wasn't a great card. But tell me what you guys thought it was, and I'll get your comments in on the show. In the co-main event of the evening, we talked about already, Ricardo Lamas defeated Darren the Damage Elkins. Because we've talked about the fights already, and I'm not too excited to talk <coughs> about the rest of them, let's go over uh, how my bets went tonight. What do you think about that? I'm going to move you guys over here. Look at my bets. Okay, so I follow a couple of guys on Twitter for their bets. Some of them are paid for. Some of them are free. But I follow at MMA Vegas Pete and MMA L O T N. Sometimes I follow 
magic underscore MMA. But here are the bets that I made with my own mind and in conjunction with those guys on Twitter. Follow them if you want some great bets. So I bet on Ponzinibbio 5 to beat Darren Elkins at uh, minus 160. I put 5 units on it. I profited 2.94 units on that. I also put uh, 4 units on Ian Heinish over Cesar Fajaya, which Heinish really dominated Cesar Fajaya. It was a 30-27, 29-28, 29-28 victory for Heinish. Uh, but I thought it was 30-27, maybe even 30-26, because in the third round, Heinish had Fajaya hurt a bunch of times, was hitting him with big power shots, but then he would just go in for a clinch when he had Fajaya hurt really bad. Basically, he was rushing forward, and his momentum carried him into the clinch, where Fajaya would try to look for takedowns, but Heinish has a background in wrestling and did a really good job either keeping the fight on the feet or standing back up once he got taken down but I put four units on Heinish at plus 160 that profited 6.4 units so I'm doing really well there but earlier in the night I put three units on Pollyanna Botello and she got destroyed by Cynthia Calvillo Cynthia Calvillo caught a kick from Botello got Botello to the ground Botello went to just kind of stand up Derek the Black Beast Lewis style and Calvillo put in the Mata de Leon uh, without the hooks in, rear naked choke without the hooks in, and Calvillo just cut through her like like nothing. So I lost three units on that, and uh, I had a earlier bet on Yuta Uluka Sosaki over Alexandre Pantoja. Wow, that was really stupid. Uh, I bet one unit on him at plus one at plus two sixty. He lost, of course, so I lost that. But I ended up betting a total of eighteen units. Profited 7.67 units for an ROI, which is a return on investment of 43%. But my betting record overall, I'm minus 13 units in my career. So RC Kim says Ponzinibbio should either fight Wonder Boy or Darren Till. I always leave Darren Till out of my who they should fight next things because Darren Till has been flirting with the idea of moving to middleweight a bunch of times. And in fact, I saw a few people that I follow on Twitter this week talking about who would you pick to win a fight between Darren Till and Israel, the last style bender, Adesanya. One, I'd pick Adesanya. And two, I do think that Darren Till should stick with fighting at welterweight. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, if you watch the fight card, instead of me talking about the rest of them in too much depth here, let's talk about who we would give post-fight bonuses to and we'll use that as a way to talk about each one of the fights. Huh. RC Kim says he looks forward to seeing Oka Sasaki on Ryzen's New Year's Eve show. Yeah, probably, but also think about this, RC Kim. If Pantoja, who took Sasaki down, rear naked choked him at 218 of the first round, well, no. Uh, Sasaki took Pantoja down, was on top of him, was going to rain down some ground and pound. Pantoja was throwing up uh, triangles and armbar attempts, ends up uh, getting the back of Sasaki in a scramble, and got that rear naked choke. Anyway, if Pantoja, like Zane was saying, is too small to go up and compete at Bantamweight, even though he called out Joseph Benavidez in his post-fed interview, it... He might be out of the UFC too if he doesn't want to go up to bantamweight because it does seem like the UFC is killing the 125-pound division. So, dude, we could see both Pantoja and Sasaki on Ryzen's New Year's Eve show. Wouldn't that just be something? And uh, maybe Pantoja could be a guy who'd fight Horiguchi in the near future. Craziness. But post-fight bonuses... I think you have to give a post-fight bonus to Johnny Walker for his fucking smacking elbow knockout of Khalil Roundtree at 157 of the very first round. It came, Johnny Walker ate an outside low kick on the left thigh from Roundtree earlier, and he kind of rubbed it and mocked Roundtree and was like, oh, no, that hurt a little bit. Then he comes up with a right high kick, kind of stuns Roundtree. Roundtree kind of moves back and then tries to come in and clinch Walker, Walker gets him in plum clinch and then elbows him into the shadow realm. Sleep, sleeping, slept him like nothing. Uh, Zaman, Zaman says post fight bonuses go to Walker and Calvillo. 
Yeah, so Calvillo, I already talked about, caught that kick, got the rear naked on Poliana Botello. Would you give uh, Marcus McGahee says, performances go to Walker, Ian Heinish, Calvillo, and either Elkins Lamas for fight of the night or extra performance bonus for Pajeris and Pantoja. You get it, Marcus. We always give out five because we're not actually giving anybody any money at all. Uh, yeah, I think I'm going to give out five post-fight bonuses. The first four fights of the night, honestly, I was playing Fortnite trying to get some, you know. I, this is off the topic of, of watching the fights. But I, w I have a Fortnite account on PC, and I kept signing in and noticing that, that my outfit had changed. And I just thought there was a glitch or something. But then I saw that all my V-Bucks had been spent. And I'm like, what the fuck? Somebody hacked into my Fortnite account on a PlayStation and had played 200 squad games with my account. And then spent all my V-Bucks. So I don't have V-Bucks to spend toward the next season right now. So I was trying to get some experience so that I could use... I don't have to pay any more real dollars for the next season of... Fortnite. So that's what I was doing during these first four fights. I told myself if they ever got exciting, I'd put the controller down and just pay attention to the fights. It never happened. So it wasn't until Pantoja versus Sasaki that I knew that would be a good one. I put it down and started paying attention. But so my post fight bonuses, I'd go Ponzinibbio, Walker, Vera, Calvillo, and Prezerish. Oh, that's so tough. I'm going to, uh, man, I think that Pantoja, Prejeris, oh, Calvillo can't get one because she missed weight, so she doesn't, she's not eligible for a post-fight bonus, but I'll say uh, Ponzinibbio, Walker, Vera, Prejeris, and Pantoja. Those are my post-fight bonuses. Uh, RC Kim, Pons gets a post-fight bonus when your opponent face plants equals bonus money. It's RC Kim, especially when that shit happens in the main event of the evening. Uh, speaking of, I was just kind of doing a Bruce Buffer thing there. Joe Martinez was the ring announcer tonight because he's bilingual. We are in Buenos Aires, Argentina, of course. Did a fucking phenomenal job, man. Joe Martinez is a really good ring announcer, really good at what Bruce Buffer does, especially when we go to these Spanish-speaking countries. If I could give you uh, a what-the-fuck of the card, and this just speaks to how not cultured I am, I guess, but I learned uh, in the fight between Marlon Chito Vera and Guido Canetti, when Vera was walking out, that... In Hispanic cultures or in Hispanic countries like Argentina, whistling at somebody is like kind of like booing them. So when Vera walked to the octagon, everybody was whistling at him, and it means bad things. I had no idea that whistling at somebody in Argentina was an insult. Just like, what the fuck? That's weird. And also a WTF at myself for not being very cultured. But because of mixed martial arts, this face-punching sport... I'm becoming more cultured every single time we watch a fight card because I learned something like this. I'll use this as a way to talk about Marlon Vera and why I'd give him a post-fight bonus. In the first round, he clearly lost to Guido Canetti. Canetti was moving forward, uh, pressing the action, coming forward with those like John Lineker, lead left hook, wide right type of combinations. Got Vera to the ground and uh, had some control time on him. Clearly, Canetti won the first round. Between rounds one and two, Vera's corner told him that he needed to wake the fuck up and press forward and get this fight uh, into his realm. He did exactly that. Start of the second round, Vera's moving forward, uh, trying to close the distance. Had a little bit of trouble to close the distance on Kinetti. Decides to go for like a jumping switch kick, but it was he was too tight, so it was kind of like a jumping switch kick knee type of thing, but that got him in close. It got Kinetti's back up against the fence. Vera locked on the plum clinch and fucking smashed his face in with knees similar to what Anderson Silva did to Rich Franklin so many years ago. It sent Kennedy to the ground. Uh, Vera went and jumped on a guillotine on Kennedy. Couldn't get it. Kennedy popped out of it. Vera got back to the feet uh, and then some rear hand uppercuts, left uppercuts, uh, dropped Kennedy again, 
and Vera followed him to the ground, got the rear naked choke at 131 of the second round. Amazing performance from Marlon Vera. Ordinarily, when I do like the top three fights to watch for each fight card, which uh, SB and MMA didn't want me to do for this fight card because they thought the numbers would be too bad because there's not a lot of interest in it. Uh, Vera is usually on that list because he's an exciting fighter because of things like this. He lost the first round and then comes back. I love Ebbs. I love Flows. He's a really fun fighter to watch. RC Kim, but in the post-fight interview where Pond says, allow me to speak English for the audience here or whatever, how suave was that? Uh, yeah, I always love it when fighters speak out of their native tongue. I, I respect it so much. I only speak one language, English. I can say some words in Spanish, but I couldn't understand you in a conversation, so I'm always really impressed when these guys who punch faces and get punched as well for a living are bilingual and they are respectful enough that whatever place they are in they'll speak the native language so that they can gain some local fans is one reason why they do it but it just it's so awesome that they do that so Ponzinibbio speaking English to the viewing audience was awesome and then also Ian Heinish after beating Cesar Fajaya well, spoke a little Spanish when Jimmy Smith was like Yada yada, tell me about the fight. Gives him the microphone, immediately, immediately goes into uh, gracias, you know, uh, type of stuff. I'm sorry, my Sp I don't, I'm not a Spanish speaker. But anyway, I was impressed by Ian Heinish. And uh, if you don't know Ian Heinish's background, he's a former drug, like dealer. Uh, was in prison. He's out of that now, and he's all he, now he's a mixed martial artist. That I think what's next for Johnny Walker could be somebody like Shoeface. Uh, or perhaps um, the winner of Uriah Primetime Hall versus Bevan Lewis would be a good option. Or perhaps that guy from Alabama, the linebacker from Alabama. What the fuck's that guy's name? Why am I blanking on it? Hold on a sec. The winner of... You, uh, no. What the fuck? Excuse me, sorry. The winner of... Who's got me? Oh, yeah. Eric, your boy, Anders, versus Elias Theodoru. Why can't I find your boy on the rankings on Tapology? Is he that far down? Must be. Anyway, yeah, thanks for being here. That's why, that's why you guys are my co-host. Thank you, Marcus McGahey. And Joey Serpa... Johnny Walker versus Dominic Reyes. I think that would be fucking phenomenal. Such a fun fight. I know that it's a contender killer and a, a young guy rising up the ranks killer. I mean, neither one's going to die, hopefully. But, you know, they just are eliminated from rising up the ranks to potentially get a title shot. But in the light heavyweight division where things are so shallow that a like, barely fringe top 15 middleweight and Anthony Lionheart Smith can go up and potentially get a title shot against Johnny Bones. You can move up the ranks really, really fast. So I expect some cool things from Johnny Walker. Super athletic, huge guy, obviously hitched like a truck, had some personality, some suave inside that octagon. I'm excited to see Johnny Walker again. I think that's going to do it for our show, unless you guys got something else to talk about. I think I'm skipping the next UFC event, which is headlined by a rematch between Francis the Predator and Ganu and Curtis Razor Blades. It is starting at like 2 in the morning, my time, next week. And it's also Thanksgiving weekend. I have, I have Thanksgivings every single day next weekend. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I have a Thanksgiving to go to every single day. I haven't asked the bosses yet if I could have the day off, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to, and I really hope that they they allow me to have the day off. If you're still here, please give the video a thumbs up. I'm going to be linking you in the comment section or in the description box down below where you can get the audio-only version of this post-fight show on iTunes or SoundCloud or Stitcher, you can search for Flying Brian Show, you know, Flying without the G, Brian with an I Show on your favorite podcast platform, and that'll get you the post fight shows uh, for every UFC event except for UFC 
Beijing, which I'm going to skip because of Thanksgiving. Thank you guys so much for being... Uh, Joey, uh, I hate doing this because I already did my sign-off, but somebody wants me to talk about something else, and I'll oblige you. Talk about how badly Colby beats Woodley. I don't think Colby beats Woodley very badly. I think that Colby has really good wrestling, and that's about it. Some pressuring control game. Hey, he did hit pretty hard against Damian Maya and against Rafael Los Anjos just because of the threat of his takedowns. But look, man, Tyron Woodley has the same level or the same expertise in wrestling, and then Woodley hits harder. So I'm going to be picking Tyron Woodley to win that one. But got to respect the tenacity and the mental fortitude that Colby Covington brings to the octagon. Still going to pick Tyron Woodley to win, though. Thanks again for being here, guys. Please give the video a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you on my next video. Namaste. Also, cheers. Let's drink a beer.